ESF is the oldest, largest, and most distinguished institution in the United States that is focused on the study of natural resources and the environment. Hello and welcome to this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. I'm Dave White. And our focus in this program is landscape architecture. We will share a couple of examples of how the landscape architecture profession works. We'll visit a couple of garden roofs to see how landscape architecture works in an urban setting. But we begin in a more rural location, the Roosevelt Estate along the Hudson River in Hyde Park, New York. Professor Emeritus George Curry explains how the college was involved in the development and preservation of the estate. The pre presentation um, that I'm about to give is going to include a short vignette of the three players, uh, FDR, ESF, and the NPS. Actually, there's a fourth player that's equally important, but it ruins the symmetry of the slide. <laughs> and that is Eleanor Roosevelt. Our second player, or third, depending on how you count it, is ESF. As many of you in this audience know, uh, the College of Forestry was founded in 1911. This is a 1930s photograph of Bray Hall, which was built in 1917, our first building here on campus. In 1929, FDR engaged the College of Forestry to help him manage his forest plantations. Professor Nelson C. Brown worked with FDR from 1929 to 1945. In 1991, ESF's Department of Landscape Architecture and the NPS North Atlantic Region signed a cooperative agreement to do research and, and produce cultural landscape report. Since 1991, there have been many graduate students and undergraduate students who have been supported through the grants that we have received from the National Park Service. The purpose of the National Park Service is to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic resources to, bri to provide for the enjoyment of these in such a manner that they will be left unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. And the National Park Service has under its stewardship 84 million acres of land. That is a lot of land. The largest proportion, over half of that, is located in Alaska. In 1935, Congress passed the Historic Sites Act, which established the National Park Service as the preliminary, primary, excuse me, federal agency responsible for historic preservation activities in the United States. In 1939, at FDR's request, Congress established the home of FDR National Historic Site according to the provisions of the 1935 Act. And upon his death in 45, in no, I think November of that year after Mrs. Roosevelt moved out of the house, uh, the Park Service takes over the site and it's open to the public on April 12th, 1946. The photo in this slide is in fact the opening ceremony uh, at the 1946 uh, event. It's interesting in light of the importance of these lands, especially the historic lands the National Park Service uh, is stewardship to, uh, is that it wasn't until 1988 that the national parks recognized landscapes as a resource, a historic and cultural resource. So by the 1990s, the National Park Service was entering into all sorts of cooperative agreements with various institutions, universities, and other uh, interested groups 
to investigate how to deal, what was the approach for this new resource. And it was in 1991 that the Department of Landscape Architects signed their first cooperative agreement. The home of FDR is located about 80 miles north of New York City and about 60 miles south of Albany in the Hudson River Valley. And you can see uh, on this map the approximate location of the site. Governor Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt in front of Bray Hall meeting with Dean Moon and others in July of 1928. The following year, FDR established arrangements to have the college advise him on forest matters including planting, management, and harvesting uh, with Professor uh, Nelson Brown as the key contact. This is a 1932 aerial view of the Roosevelt Estate. In 1867, FDR's father, James Roosevelt, bought the Wheeler Estate, which included this 1850 Italianate villa and 110 acres of land. He and his first wife, Rebecca, had a son named James, also known as Rosie, and moved into the house and renamed it Springwood. Unfortunately, Rebecca died in 1876, and James and Sarah Roosevelt, 26 younger, years younger than FDR's father, James, were married in 1880 and had one son, FDR, born in 1882. When James died in 1900, the estate was 720 acres. Upon James' death, Springwood was left to FDR and his mother, Sarah. Sarah actually lived in the house with FDR's family until she died in 1941. So virtually, since he died in 45, Virtually his entire married life was with his mother in the house. <laughs> Professor Curry's presentation was part of the Dale Travis lecture series. We'll continue in a moment. I'm here with a group of students from um, SUNY ESF and we're doing a study of the recreational use of Onondaga Lake. So people that go on boats or fishing. We are interested to see how human behaviors have changed over time since the lake has been going through the process of becoming cleaner and less polluted from its industrial past. I've grown up hearing about how polluted the lake is and now that it is starting to be cleaner People are interacting with the lake. Getting a better understanding of that human aspect uh, will be beneficial for future policies around the lake. There's about 10 other student researchers with me on this project. All of us, I would say, are interested overall in the interactions of people and the environment. Uh, keep your eye on these three windows in the main section of the Italianate Villa because FDR and Sarah had the house made over in 1915 and 16 when FDR was Assistant Secretary of the Navy into this colonial revival style building. The house was greatly expanded. <laughs> Those three windows that I showed you are these three windows. And it's this middle section right here which was the original part of the house. In 1939, FDR deeded 16.3 acres to the National Archives for the FDR Library that was built in between 1939 and 41. This was the first presidential library and since that time every president since then has had their own presidential library. By the time of FDR's death, Springwood had grown to approximately 1,500 
and 22 acres of land. As he kept buying farms surrounding his uh, estate to expand his scientific forestry plantations. Now, it's probably important to say that FDR was part of reforestation movement, which was a conservation effort spearheaded largely by the state of New York to address the state's timber, land, and water resources. Primary purpose was to restore the state's growing amount of worn out and abandoned farmland and take that into productivity. While well, FDR appreciated nature, he planted trees primarily for the productive use of his land. As I said earlier in 1928, FDR decided to engage the services of the college to help him manage his plantations in the native hardwood forest. And again, Nelson Brown of the college served as F FDR's forestry advisor. Here is a photograph of FDR in the driver's seat and Brown in the back seat touring a timber harvest at the estate in 1944. Brown was a great fan of FDR's and published numerous glowing articles about his forestry work. This is an interesting slide. It's a tree planting crew and to our knowledge, probably College of Forestry students, setting out a red pine plantation on the Roosevelt Estate along Route 9G in 1930. It was one of 38 demonstration and experimental plots set out by the college at the Roosevelt Estate between 1930 and 1933. The College of Forestry planted a total of 88,600 trees uh, on the estate. FDR experimented with growing Christmas trees, which he felt would be a good crop for farmers because they could provide a quick return. Nelson Brown helped FDR market his trees to large New York City retailers like Macy's and Bloomingdale's. From 1912 until his death in 1945, FDR oversaw the planting of more than 550,000 trees in 81 plantations on the estate. After the president died, uh, Nelson Brown continued to advise FDR's son, Elliot, uh, about managing the plantations until 1947. The 23 plantations that survive within the boundaries of uh, the Roosevelt, two Roosevelt National Historic Sites have not been managed uh, since 1947. Remnants of FDR's plantations also remain in the subdivisions that were built in the 1950s and 60s on a state property. Coming up shortly, we'll visit a couple of rooftop gardens, one with some very unusual plants, but first a break and then Professor Curry with a little more on the Roosevelt Estate. So this boat left here in 1939. We were able to bring it back to the Adirondacks where it had been gone for about 74 years and we were able to restore it. And one of the things that really excited us about using the boats for education is that we can put together really neat programs on the water and allow people to experience what is really largely a bygone way of uh, engaging the Adirondacks and seeing this beautiful landscape. So we'll have three guide boats. We found two individuals that are really excited also about our program and they're gonna donate their time and their boats to us. So we'll have five guide boats available so we can take out at any time up to 15 people to teach them about the you know, lake ecology, human history here, boat design, and this, you know, this great cultural artifact, forestry, uh, wildlife management, all these things that we're so involved in with the college, and to be able to do that from a water-based uh, platform we thought was really different. In 1997, a project agreement was signed to prepare a cultural landscape report for the home of FDR National Historic Site. It was completed in 1999 by Kristen Baker, 
as a thesis for her MLA degree. It was the first of a number of planning documents that the department would prepare for the National Park Service. In 2003, a historic resource study was begun to document the historic development of the entire 1,500 plus acres of the Roosevelt Estate and to document FDR's conservation and forestry practices. In 2005, there was an agreement signed that, to prepare the treatment plan uh, for the home of FDR. And as part of this agreement with the National Park Service, uh, there was funding for a preservation studio. And in the spring of 2006, a group of BLA and MLA students authored this report, with, which was the concept development for the treatment plan. Also recommended uh, was to reestablish the view. This is the south lawn here. You can see this arrow pointing out to where the view was, to reinstate or reestablish uh, the view to the river and its bridge and the mountains beyond from the South Lawn. A 1942 photograph of Mrs. Roosevelt and MFDR uh, on the South Lawn with the view of the bridge over the Hudson in the background. Uh, this view was so treasured by FDR and his father James that in both of their wills it was stated that the view had to be maintained and protected. The bridge today is the walkway over the Hudson. This is the view that has vanished. The view has not been protected nor has it been managed and until recently the National Park Service did not own the wood land that is blocking the view. In the CLR, it was recommended again that the newly required woodland be managed so that the view could once again be part of this important landscape. As a result of this recommendation, the home of FDR entered into an agreement with Dr. Christopher Nowak of ESF to prepare a view shed management plan. This is a poster prepared by graduate student Rebecca McGuire uh, and presented at a conference. Following the view shed management plan, Dr. Nowak and his graduate students completed a study of the historic uh, plantations in 2010. The study provides a detailed inventory of the 23 extent individual stands and their site conditions and outlines management goals for each of the stands. Here is one of FDR's favorite tulip poplar uh, stands planted in 1917. The top photograph is before and the lower is done, it's taken after the recommended treatments of the study. For those of us who have had the pleasure and the opportunity to work on the various FDR and ER projects, it has been a true honor. These are some of the most important cultural resources within the entire national park system. Thus, ESF has played an important role for 34 years in protecting and managing these significant cultural landscapes. The college will continue to work with the NPS on the estate lands into the foreseeable future. From the great outdoors with acres and acres of land to work with, how about landscape architecture in a more confined setting, like the roof of a building? That's where we'll go next. At a casual glance from the sidewalk, it might look like these old houses are being demolished. But that's not the case. They're being deconstructed so materials and fixtures can be reused or recycled. Reuse means I'm going to take this product from this house and I'm going to incorporate it into another project. As opposed to recycling. Recycling is, let's say I have a bunch of busted, broken 2x4s that I can't reuse and I can take that to a facility that will grind it up and turn it into mulch. This project is dubbed a hybrid deconstruction. Our first 
wave, we send people in and we pull out all the windows, all the doors, all the cabinets, all the fixtures, everything that we believe is valuable enough. We pick up that panel, lower it to the ground and rip it apart and get all the two by eights and tens and twelves or whatever it is out of there. And all the flooring if we can. So what's the market for reusing this lumber? Right now, most of this lumber is used for aesthetics and finishes. Um, exterior siding, interior flooring, um, clapboard, all that kind of stuff. A garden roof serves a number of purposes, both aesthetic and practical, as Tara DeSantis explains in this report. It's a convention center and performance venue where many Syracusians attend events, or at least drive by as they're passing through downtown. But there's more to the on center than one can see from the ground. On a warm spring day, Professor Cliff Davidson and his team of research students use a special key to enter an area alongside large air conditioning tubes and up not one, but two metal ladders until they reach the top. Welcome to the On Center Green Roof. At nearly 60,000 square feet, it's one of the largest green roofs in the entire Northeast region. Green roofs have become very popular in, in recent years. Um, as you know, lots of cities have uh, a lot of um, buildings and those buildings mostly have impervious roofs and so therefore that's a lot of surface area and that means a lot of rain going into the storm sewers, um, the combination storm sewers and sanitary sewers. Uh, the, the green roofs are planted with different types of plants that are known to be very hardy under different weather conditions. The, the plant of choice for many green roofs is from uh, the family known as sedum. Sedum plants are extremely hardy. They can live under drought conditions when there's not very much water. They can live under flooding conditions. Uh, they, they last a long time. The equipment that we have, which most green roofs do not have, uh, requires constant maintenance. There are lots of different sensors up here, and those sensors need to be calibrated uh, they need to be repaired. There's maintenance work that has to be done on them uh, frequently, and so that's a very different story. It's not the first green rooftop in the United States, but it is one of the first to be used as a giant experiment. In 2011, when it was installed, environmental engineer Professor Davidson and his students started taking various measurements to record the water levels, contaminants, and growth levels. The material on the roof is only a few inches deep and contains special nutrient-rich soil and sedum, an especially hardy plant that requires little maintenance. There is highly specialized equipment to record a whole host of data. Here what we have is known as a tipping bucket and that is our third device that we use on the roof to measure the precipitation, specifically the rainfall amount. And the way this device works is essentially we know the area of this opening here and then it's a protected casing and inside here we have a scale that essentially with a set amount of precipitation it will tip to the other side and then when it receives that exact amount of precipitation it will tip back. And so we just measure the number of tips that we get. Right next to the tipping bucket we have another instrument called a pyranometer and that is used to measure the incoming energy from the sun. We can actually dial this to focus on specific wavelengths of sunlight that's coming in. So we can um, test a lot of things about transportation or the runoff from these groups. It's really a great place. Across town at SUNY ESF, there's a more accessible green space, right upstairs on the Gateway Building. No ladder required. Environmental and Forest Biology Department Chair Don Leopold says the function of this green roof is a little bit different. It's absolutely doing well. It, they deserve signs now to tell people who they are, and that'll really make it a much more valuable experience for the general public. And we welcome the general public to see this. The space doesn't require much maintenance, but students are helping to clear the accumulation of plant material, or biomass, to make way for new spring growth. Uh, in nature, these places would be burned um, by uh, natural events like lightning strikes. They might be heavily grazed, so the, the fair question is, is why do you have to do this here when you don't have to in nature, when in fact it is done in nature by natural processes or by uh, grazers that are part of a farming operation. Unlike the sedum at the on-center's roof, 
ESF is experimenting with unique and rare plant species. It's up here are unusual that they're very hard to see naturally out throughout all of New York State, but there are some that only occur at one or two places. Um, one of those would be the Houghton's Goldenrod. It's actually federally listed, so it's very, very rare. We grew some for a project and we had them left over, so we tried them up here. But we have a, a plant that everybody knows, the horizontal juniper, is actually in nature one of the rare shrubs in the northeast, and we have that growing up here. We have um, really a large number of plants that you would never see unless you went out to the Midwest. For example, the, the prairie smoke was just discovered in New York State in 1981 up in these prairie-like places northwest of Watertown. And uh, so very rare, it was just recently found, and it's doing very well on the roof. And along with the plants come extra visitors. We don't think that this planting is big enough to draw in the unique insects that would be associated with these uh, plants. But that's what ecology is, why it's sometimes so overwhelming. You get a lot of surprises. So we're taking a, a view on what's happening up here with associated um, animals. We know we won't have to worry about deer, which are the, a major threat to biodiversity in the Northeast. Um, so some animals will show up because they're sort of generalists. The Green Roof's first season was in 2013. Since then, landscape architecture professor Tim Tolan is pleased with how the roof is turning out. Phenomenal growth with, with just about all of the species. Um, we haven't had any areas where there's been major dieback and um, the, the plants have been reproducing, growing, and actually we, we're starting to see some kind of jump and move around. Um, some of these dispersed by seed and wind, windborne seed and they're starting to, to, to organize themselves. And I've had um, requests for information from designers and architects and others who are looking to, to follow a similar concept. Professor Tolan says the team is excited by the people interacting with the features on the roof. Great, people, as I've seen and as we've given tours and I've just casually observed, you know, they're looking at the plants, they're engaging them, they're wanting to know what they are, um, they're asking about what's in bloom, things like that. So, you know, the, the community is really greatly appreciative of it and very inquisitive about it. And, you know, we're more than happy to give them the information that, they, that they're asking for. Whether used for measuring data or designed to beautify a space the public is encouraged to visit, green roofs are becoming more popular around the United States and with the people of Syracuse. That's it for this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again next time.